How can you invest and make money in today's real estate market? Welcome to the Successful Investor Show, where we talk with successful real estate investors, business owners, and busy professionals on their journey to wealth. They share their best ways and advice to make massive gains in today's market. Make sure you are subscribed so you never miss an episode. Now, here is your host, Doran Nissin. Welcome, everyone, to the Successful Investor Show, where we talk about how to passively invest and create passive income and generational wealth without doing all the work. I'm your host, Doron Nissim, and today I have the pleasure to welcome our guest, Ethan Gao. Ethan has owned several rental properties. He's made over 300 private loans secured by real estate, which we call private lender, commercial real estate, and invested in over 100 single family and commercial flips. He is a general partner on multiple commercial and multifamily projects totaling over 1,500 units, which is amazing. His primary role in those deals is a KP funder. He funds the deals if the partnership cannot find the fund. So that's what he does. Welcome, Ethan. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. So tell us about your background. You've been doing this for a while and you, you've done so many uh, transactions. Yeah, so I started uh, about eight, nine years ago uh, as a single family fix and flip uh, private money lender. So I would lend money to people fixing and flipping houses in the Houston, Texas area. And about three years ago, I transitioned to doing a lot more commercial and multifamily. How did you start it to do real estate? What, what made you go from Wall Street to real estate basically? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I have a super normal um, corporate type of career working at super prestigious law firms and things like that. Uh, those are really difficult jobs to work at and to advance in. Um, you're competing against really talented, smart people that are willing to work really hard. Uh, so I was at a spot in my career where it didn't really make sense for me to try to advance. So I was trying to figure out where else to go. And I researched two specific things. One was franchises and the other was real estate. And with franchises, I did a ton of due diligence and I concluded on the ones that I was looking at, only a franchise is basically like buying a shitty job. And I figured I already had that. I, like, why did I need to go buy it? You know, in fact, the job I had paid me 300, 400 K a year. So I don't need to go wow. buy a crappy job. Uh, whereas, uh, real estate, uh, what I liked about it was a lot of the gurus and people that have been in it for a long time, when you, re when you watch their interviews, they're not really being serious, but they're also not a hundred percent joking either. There's a half truth in it. A lot of those guys say like how bad of a student they were in high school or college and how they couldn't work for someone else. And, you know, they had to create their own way and they started with $0 and they borrowed every penny and now they've made it. So I really liked that story because I was the opposite of that. So I was extremely good student. I could definitely work for people. I made tons of money at my real job. Um, so I felt like coming into real estate with millions of dollars of my own money and a law degree and experience as a corporate lawyer would put me in the top half or maybe top quarter just out of the gate. So that's why I decided to get into uh, real estate. Nice, nice. Yeah, and I see a lot of uh, attorneys, lawyers, that they practice law, but they also turn to go to the hard money lending and they do their own loans uh, because they, they know that structure and they, yeah. they, they feel comfortable in that, in that space. They don't need to buy the property and fix it and do all the work. They just do the paperwork and get the sure. money. Yep. So, so I see that a lot. Wow. So that's amazing. And it's a good choice. And let's say going, going to real estate from a corporate America job to real estate, it's, it's a good choice. Yep. Yeah. So did you have any, like a moment that in your journey in real estate or even before that you say, this is what I want to do, like a ha, -ha moment. This is what I'm going to do. Yeah. It was really my first deal. So my first deal, I met a guy off of bigger pockets. Um, he had a corporate job. He was a college graduate, really nice guy, family oriented, just, just the best guy ever. And he basically said, Hey man, I need to borrow like a hundred K to buy this house. I've already sold this house to someone else, but they need two more weeks to close. So I have to actually just borrow your money for two weeks. I can't get it. I can't do a perfect wholesale where it's like just all happens simultaneously. And I said, okay, cool. 
And uh, believe it or not, he paid me off in two weeks. So I made a wow. bunch of money for lending my first deal two weeks. I was like, holy shit, this is the best thing ever. Uh, there was basically no risk or extremely low risk. And I called that guy back and I said, can we do all of them? Like every single one. And yeah, so wow. I, I, I did about 50 deals with that guy over three years. Wow, amazing. So you got him off of Bigger Pockets, which is um, like a, a website for real estate investors. And uh, you formed the, the relationship. And out of that, you made 50 deals. That's amazing. Yep. With wow. that one guy. And then I did a bunch of deals with a ton of other people too. Amazing. Obviously, when you make, when you make money on a deal, you're just like, wow, I want to keep doing that. Exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. So let me ask you another question about that. What's the most successful deal you ever made? Uh, I would say that's probably one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. That one where you paid me off in two, two weeks. I've also done several transactional funding loans where basically, um, you know, in that simultaneous process where the wholesaler is buying from a seller and then selling to a buyer at a higher price. Right. Sometimes they choose the wrong title company or they just don't really know what they're doing. And essentially, uh, they have to borrow money to do the first part of that transaction, even though they're simultaneously going to sell it. So they're borrowing money and paying fees, even though there's no risk to me on the deal at all. Mm -hmm. So I've done several of those. I love them. There, it's, you know, some people call it transactional funding. If you got a transactional loan, I'll do it. I don't even know. I don't need to know what the property is. You don't need to tell me the story. It doesn't matter because there's already a buyer and it closes simultaneously. There's basically no risk for me to lend the money. It's just the paperwork and the hassle of having to do it, which I'm going to charge you for. Nice. I will do every single, I will drop, I have five kids. I will drop all five kids. <laughs> oh my God. Every single one of the kids I'll drop and I'll, <laughs> I'll do that. Yeah. So transactional funding, actually where I'm from, Florida, it's uh, you, you cannot use the buyer's money to close on a deal. So you cannot use the C, like the buyer, the end buyer to, to close on the first transaction. So you have to have a gap financing, which called transactional funding. Transactional funder in Florida, they're very successful. They put their money only when the other buyers already have money in the, in the escrow. So they have no risk and they put the money and they get it 10 minutes later with, with their fee, which is sometimes it's a lot. So people love that business. It's a good business here. In yeah, Florida. I didn't even realize that's how it worked in um, Florida. So I also work in title. I'm a fee attorney with a title company here. So we do title and escrow. And uh, so about half of them in Texas will let you have the BC fund the whole thing, but the other half won't. So having a relationship with the half that won't is a great way of potentially getting business. Right. So you, I didn't realize it was like, I, I need to go. So you need to come to, to Florida. I need to hire somebody to do business <laughs> development in Florida and just walk around to every title company and ask them if they need this. Exactly. Yeah. Transactional funding in Florida is a big business. So that's good. So, you know, everybody's talking about the recession, market going down, things like that. So I want to ask you, what do you think? What are the things that you do to mitigate the risk on the deals that you do in today's market? Uh, I don't really do anything different. So global macro is something that's incredibly hard to trade. Just macro in general is super hard to trade. So I just tell people, just focus on what you're doing. Right. Focus on I what just, you're doing, what you're doing the best and keep doing that. Yeah. Just focus on buying it cheap and then uh, having enough either dry powder or enough reserves, or you have a longer term loan where you can just hold it, where nobody can put a gun to your head and force you to sell it at a loss. Right. And you should be fine. Yeah, a lot of the people last year, they bought with uh, bridge financing, they bought commercial properties with bridge financing, and, and it's going to come to you know, a point where, where they need to refinance, and they might be in a bad position right now because of the interest rate. But uh, other than that, if you buy it in a good price and you have a good term, you can keep holding that asset until everything cool off and you know, start coming back up. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, I love that. So we're going to move to the fire round, which is four questions that I'm going to ask you and uh, just fire it. Uh, so what are the three success habits that you have? Do you have any success habits in your business or in your life? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say they're habits, but I'll just tell this story because a lot of people thought it's cool when I told it to them. So I graduated from college when I was 19 years old. So I didn't know anything. Wow. Um, I wasn't even like the, like I, I was smart. I was book smart, but I wasn't like a wise or 
you know, particularly savvy 19 year old. And I just went straight to law school. I was probably either the youngest guy there or the second youngest guy there. Um, and I graduated from law school at 22, also not particularly sophisticated, wise or savvy. And most of the people that graduated with me were 27. So they were five years older than me. Mm -hmm. And so we all started at the same job, which is the bottom. First year associate at a top tier uh, New York based international law firm. And I just remember that particular year, those 2006. So salaries for uh, junior lawyers, so first year associates, went from 125K per year in 2006 to $160,000, a $35,000 increase in pay. So when I accepted my offer, it was for 125K annual salary. And by the time I showed up my first day of work, it had increased to 160K. Wow. And that was just the market. I didn't, it wasn't because I was particularly good looking or right. tall or, or whatever. It was just the market. The market dictated it and the top law firms all went to that price point. And so I remember one of the first days um, in the law firm, one of the senior partners who'd been around for a while, he was like, look guys, we are going to pay you 125K and you are all super happy to take that. And now because the market dictated it, we're paying you 160K. He was like, none of you know anything. You're all dumb shits. You just graduated. And I know they didn't teach you anything in law school. So the least you could possibly do is to reply to your emails, check your voicemails, and return calls. He was like, that's just the least you could do. You can't really do less than that. And I really took that to heart. I was like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I'm, like, I'm not even 27. I'm 22. I really don't know anything. I don't know anything about anything. I, my parents aren't lawyers. I didn't even have friends that were lawyers. I basically chose the job because I thought it would be cool and I knew they made a lot of money. So that's really all I started with. And oh. I said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to respond to things really fast and I'm going to make sure I don't miss stuff. So I always reply extremely quick. Like when you messaged me um, in the morning, I replied right away. And then I emailed you my information. I love that. Yes, and then, it's and amazing. You, and then you and then you messaged me an hour ago. You're like, hey, can you send me the bio? And I said, check your email from the morning. And you're like, okay, cool. Right. So I check my text. I check my email. I check my voicemails. Uh, even if a phone call comes in and it says spam, I'll actually take it unless wow. I'm in a meeting or I'm uh, like really busy doing something. I'll take it just in case it's not spam. The spam filter is pretty good. I would say like only 5% of the time is a call not spam. The other 95 is just pure garbage. <laughs> yeah. But that's what wow. I do. So uh, if somebody I don't like, I'll reply back. If it's somebody I do like, I'll reply back. That's amazing. Um, you, know, you you email me, do you like blue? I'll say, sure. You email me, do you like dogs? I'll say, fine. Um, I, I just respond, right? And uh, so that's just something I always do. So it's if amazing. I don't respond, and it's been a while, you're going to need to call the police because something happened. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have responded. Right. Even if I don't like you, I most likely wow. I would have responded. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That, that's a good habit. That's a good habit to have. And most people will not respond. They will see your email. They will respond two weeks later. Well, yes. Things like crazy things. And like, this is a good habit to have. Yeah, it's, it's a success habit for sure. Yep. And especially and you, the business I'm in, I'm in the acute need for money right now business, right? right. That's why I charge these premiums. Mm -hmm. So I have to respond. So I'm really just taking advantage of personal characteristics that I have. You know, number one, I'm very liquid in how much money I have. Number two, I'm a corporate lawyer, so I can do all the paperwork myself. And number three, I just respond really fast. So if somebody wow. literally needs money right now and they call me, I'll most likely pick up. So the biggest deal I've done on the gap funding side is a $6 million deal. They were short $6 million on their fundraising. I got a call at 9 a.m. and I wired them $6 million at 3 p.m. Wow, you hear that guys? And, I and I had to and I had to go to a business lunch in between that I couldn't cancel. Wow. Wow. So in a few hours, this guy just wired six million dollars on a deal. That's amazing. Yeah, one deal. One That's amazing. One deal. Wow, 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 wow. Yeah. It's a good resource to have. It's it's a good it's a good business partner to have. Hard money lenders, you need to remind them every day about this, about that. So amazing. So the next question, do you have any book that you read, a success book or something that you can recommend our viewers? Yeah, I don't, I don't generally read books. I find them really repetitive. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll say the usual one. I, I really like Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I read that when I was 23. I'd worked one year at the law firm and I, I read the whole thing and I put it down and I said, what a piece of shit, what a piece <laughs> of garbage this is. And all I knew back then was Wall Street. So we were yeah. like, oh, buy it at X, sell it at 2X. 
Right. Everybody, all we did was we did stock related stuff, right? We didn't know anything about cash flow, didn't know anything about real estate, didn't care. And then I read that book nine years later and I was like, oh yeah, this guy makes a lot of sense now. <laughs> um, and, and the book didn't change. <laughs> yeah. It was the same words. Just the, the mindset changed. It was the same words. It, right. it was just different. And then um, I read a ton of articles and then I'll just give this story. Hopefully people find it funny. So I, I, I hate traveling, but I took two business trips in the last two months. Uh, they were both very important for different reasons. I had to go. And so that gave me a lot of time on the plane. And I don't really just want to sit there and stare at the guy's head in front of me or like watch some movie. So I brought all these books that people had given me. Uh, right. Some people had FedEx me books. Some people just physically gave them to me and say, oh, Ethan, check this out. Right. So one I read, it was like an American dream story. Uh, it was all fictional. Another book was like how women negotiate and how that's different than men. And then I read a book about like being a kick-ass lawyer or something. And then I, I, I read a bunch of books and basically after, so, and I just read them in a row. Right. And I, I read them all. And basically wow. my conclusion was each of these books was too fucking long. Like it could have been boiled down to about three minutes. Right. Like five <laughs> pages max. Yeah. I didn't really understand why they kept going on and on. So I, I, I dislike reading books. I like reading articles instead. Yeah. So it leads me to, to the next question that what a resource, a good resource that you use in your business. To help bigger you pockets business. is a great place to meet people. Uh, mm -hmm. Bigger pockets is very, very heavily single family focused. I right. do commercial and multifamily now, but um, bigger pockets is still a great place to start. I still listen to all their podcasts uh, as they come out, and then I listen to a bunch of them. You know, when I started several years ago, they they already had a backlog of a bunch of podcasts, and I listened to all. Wow. That doesn't mean I remember most of them. I mean, most yeah. of the stories are the same. It's like, oh yeah, I found real estate. Now I'm cool. Like they're, they basically <laughs> all are the yeah. variation of that. Like it's they're all very repetitive. They say this. Like, yeah, thing. they're basically all the same. They're like, yeah, I discovered real estate. It's great. You know, hey, thanks. Right? But it's a, it's a good resource to ask questions. If you have a particular question, you probably can find it in Bigger Pockets. Yes. Bigger Pockets is a great starting place. And the forums, you can post the question and people will get back to you. So it's a great general resource for real estate. It's It's funny because most people will say, rich dad, poor dad. And bigger pockets. <laughs> yeah. But it's funny. But yeah, it, I mean, it works. It works. So you don't want yeah. to change something that worked. That's what they no, say. No, they're both good. And like I said, you know, so the Rich Bad Poor Dad, the, the book was never updated. It was the exact same version. Or I right. probably the same version. Yeah. He, 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 has, he has several other books. But yeah. Yeah, he has other books. I didn't read any of them. The book didn't change. So uh, from the age of 23 to the age of whatever, 32, something else changed within right. my life. That's what made, now the book makes sense. Right, right, right. You, if, if you read it now, you might notice things that you didn't notice. Yeah, probably. Now I read it again, I'll probably be like, this is garbage. You know, I might be <laughs> going back. So I started at, this is garbage, and then it went, oh, this is great. And I might read it now and say, oh, this is garbage again. Exactly. <laughs> it's the same words, same book. <laughs> That's funny. All right, so I want to ask you something for the people that want to make money this year. What are your three tips for making money this year in real estate? Oh, I, I, I don't have anything specific for this year. I would say number one is just choose your counterparties wisely. Mm -hmm. So choose your business partners well. Choose yeah. whoever you're lending money to well. Sometimes the best deal you do is the one that you don't do. Uh, I'm definitely, I, I've invested in, in a couple of deals that I wish I never met that person or invested in their deal. Wow. That they're necessarily bad people or bad deals, but a lot of them are just not good fits. Like their personality and my personality, they don't fit well together. So you it's know? not, it's not because of the deal. It's because of the person. That's what generally you're it's going to be because of the person, because the person is more important than the deal. Okay. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's important. And then one thing that I always do, which I always try to recommend other people do, even if it might not be realistic for a lot of them, is the way that, so I like to say this, the way that I do anything is the way that I do everything. Wow. So what does that mean? So that means if generally I reply back really fast all the time, so even if I don't like the other, part, other party on the other side of the email, I'll still reply. Cause that's just what I do, right? So if I'm like a careful attention to detail guy, gives thoughtful response, even if something is not particularly that important, uh, I would still like to do a good job. I see a lot of people, uh, they're very situational. So w one way, you know, with one specific business partner, they act one way with a different business partner, they act another way, or with one situation, they act one way and another, they act another way, right? So I just generally, for me, 
the way that I do any particular thing is the way that I basically do everything. I'm extremely consistent. And that makes it super easy for me. But again, I'm a guy that met his wife when he was 16 and we've got five kids together. So wow. like, it's really hard for me to deviate off of just the usual, right? It's, it's not mm -hmm. very, it's not very plausible, nor is it very practical to, you know, have a bunch of different things or doing things a bunch of different ways, but that's how I like to approach things. And, and many people don't. And usually for a lot of those people, I find them to be bad fits for me. Wow. So you like consistency, you like yes. to do networking and you like people that you can trust. Basically. Sure. Yep. Nice. And people that aren't consistent and I can't trust, if they can make me a lot of money, then I might still entertain them. <laughs> you might like them. <laughs> well, it just depends. It depends. I, I, I'm willing to put up with a certain amount of stuff. You know, I worked in corporate for, you know, over 12 years. So yeah. I can put up with bullshit, but I just have to be paid enough to do so. Right. So there's a right. few guys that I definitely do not match well with at all. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of opportunity with them, so it's worth it to mess around with. But if wow. the minute that they don't present those opportunities, those are not good fits for me. Wow. That's but it's something that I know. And sometimes I even tell them that, but they don't seem to care. Like, well, like they would have they stopped paying attention. They're like, we don't, I don't understand what you mean. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. They're going to say, that's too, that's too profound. That's too complicated. No, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's it reminded me of the saying or the story about the sales guy that you have on your team that you don't want to work with them. You don't want them, but they're so good at what they do. You yeah. have to have them. Yeah, you, everybody's got people like that in their lives. Yeah. And it could be your family members. It could be your dad. Like, you just really dislike working with your dad, but he's your dad and you're stuck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's good. All right, so uh, my last question for the day is, uh, so people want, they have full-time job and they have life and they have everything, but they want to invest in real estate. So what kind of advice can you, you can give them to how to start investing in real estate? Yeah, I would say make, make a conscious choice between uh, being active in the business versus being passive in the business. So if, uh, so for most people, quite honestly, they're probably better off just becoming even better at their real job and getting promoted or get a better job. That's most likely a better way for them to become wealthy versus getting distracted and trying to run a real estate business simultaneously with having a real job. Now, a lot of people do do it that way and they do transition that way. But I think like if you're, for example, if you were a doctor and you actually didn't hate being a doctor, uh, most likely you'll make more money just by being a better doctor or just by being a more experienced doctor instead of trying to flip like 10 houses while you, you know, in the hospital for 12 hours in a row. Like that's right. tough. And I don't know if that's the best choice. People like that, I would recommend that they just realize that they should most likely continue to be passive and they should just choose sponsors or uh, investors that they can trust who they think do a good job and just invest their money with those people. Because then they will do the active part. Now, if you're a doctor and you actually hate your job and you have to transition out, yeah, then then if you know you're going to be more active, then do the stuff that I said before. Pick really good counterparties. You know, you can lend your money to somebody. You can operate something and do a bunch of research so you can get up to speed. I mean, there's really no excuse at this point to be ignorant. Bigger pockets, just Google. You can find almost everything that you need. Right. Yeah, that's a good advice. So if you're good at a job, you like your jobs, Stay at your job, but find a good partner or partners and invest with them and stay passive, but you're still in the game of real estate. I Absolutely. I do see a number of people that probably are better at their real job than real estate, but just for some reason, psychologically, they feel like they have to transition into the real estate. And then I see a lot of them do terrible deals because they're so yeah. motivated to do a deal. So they just do any deal. And then sometimes the deal is ter terrible. Right, they're too fast. And it, actually, and it actually brings them back. It's like, well, you should you just wasted your time and your money. You should have just put your money with somebody that you know, or you know, maybe just get a different type of doctor job. Maybe you don't like this hospital, go to this other hospital, maybe it's better. Right, right. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. So, I mean, th those were amazing advice. Everything was great. Now, uh, if people want to get in touch with you and work with you or do business with you, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, email's best. It's just my name, Ethan Gao, E-T-H-A-N-G-A-O at gmail.com. I check that email all the time. Great. And also you have a LinkedIn page. Yeah, LinkedIn. I have a LinkedIn page, Facebook. Uh, I mean, I basically respond to every, you know, I have a WhatsApp. I mean, people basically contact me in a variety of different ways and... I respond to basically all of them, awesome. unless it's something that I don't use. Like some people ask me if I use WeChat, I don't. So maybe there's people WeChatting me and I've never responded. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have it installed. 
Right. Like I, I speak <laughs> Chinese, I speak Chinese, but I just I don't use it. I don't I don't right. have a reason to use WeChat. So there might be people trying to contact me on WeChat, but I, I've never installed it. Interesting. Wow. So yeah, that was great. That was amazing. Thank you so much for your advice and you know your input on everything. And I'm sure our listeners, viewers will get a lot of benefits from this episode. So thank you so much. Yeah, and, thank you uh, for having me. This is great to be able to share. Thank you. And we'll be in touch. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Successful Investor Show. If you're enjoying this podcast, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. Once again, thank you for tuning in, and we hope you'll join us on the next episode of The Successful Investor Show.